So I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, give me one second. Um, so yeah, good morning everybody. Um, firstly from myself, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and from the business, thank you for your continued support in what can, I guess, only be described as a rather difficult period. Um, not just in the market, but in our daily lives as well. Um, today, in essence, is the final day before a full lockdown here in SA. So I imagine a lot of you are, are dialing in from home. Um, this is also the fourth manager Q&A we've hosted so far over the course of the past week. We've had updates from um, ABEX on our flexible income fund. Um, we had um, FPA yesterday chatting about uh, Global Flexible. Apologies on, on uh, Tuesday. And yesterday, my colleague Neil had a fantastic chat with Andrew Headley at Veritas um, regarding our Global Equity Fund. Um, should you wish, I believe these recordings are available. Um, if you could just get in touch with your Net Group uh, Investments Relationship Manager and they'll be able to assist you. Today, I'm very happy to have Ian Powell on the line. Ian is the CIO at Truffle Asset Management, who sub advise on the Net Group Investments Balance Fund as well as the Managed Fund. The Balance Fund has held up relatively well over the past couple of months, um, and in fact, over all periods going back um, seven years since inception, is ranked in the top 20% um, of the SA Multi Asset High Equity category. Um, on that note, Truffle have for some time been regarded as, as a very strong equity house, and I think it's worthy to mention that uh, last month they won the Raging Bull Award uh, for their fixed income product as well, So, which I think shows the skill set um, across multiple asset classes at Truffle, um, and something that the Balance Fund is able to, to leverage off for sure. And um, in light of that, we also had a podcast with Ian uh, from last week uh, with my uh, colleague Rob Johnson, which I believe is available on all the regular podcast channels. Ian, uh, welcome to the call and thanks for taking the time out of your day to, to chat to us this morning. Thanks, David. Um, I do have some slides. Uh, I believe you aren't able to see them, but I don't think that'll be a major issue. Um, the previous calls we hosted have all been verbal. Um, but the first slide which I have put up for those that are able to see it um, was one you used at your fund manager workshop, which spoke to the COVID-19 virus um, and its escalation um, outside of the world of China. This chart would look very different today. This was from the end of Feb. I uh, checked this morning and um, at this moment in time, I think there are about 470,000 cases globally. And I guess it's, a tough, it's tough not to talk about this obvious elephant in the room. Um, so let's do begin with the virus. Um, we are now starting to see the economic response, particularly from reserve banks um, around the world. The Saab was a little bit late to the party, we, although we did have a 100 basis point cut last week to about uh, five and a quarter percent. So where do you see rates going from here, and is it a matter of how low can it go? David, I think, um, you know, as you said, maybe to take a step back is that the level of infections outside of China obviously continues to accelerate. So we are seeing uh, exponential uh, rise in terms of the rates of infections, and I think the a concern is that this simultaneous, uh, effectively global shutdown, uh, excluding China, which is now starting to to ramp up, um, but effectively is taking you know every geography other than uh, perhaps China offline at the same time mm. in in terms of demand. So I think the the tools which uh, governments and sovereigns have at their disposal for this type of, uh, I guess, event are actually fairly limited. So the one which you've already spoken to is um, monetary policy, and I think it's fair to say that the direction of rates is down everywhere. Um, but the reality is it's not really a cost of funding issue to the extent that you know it's expensive to borrow. The fact of the matter is when people around the world are having to go lock themselves in their homes for you know three weeks or, or um, you know in some cases in China three months, you are effectively taking removing a big pillar of demand and commercial activity out of the economy. So in other words, you know does lower interest rates uh, help that? And you know the answer is not really because. You know, you can't go out and really consume mm. uh, to, to the extent that sort of normal activity would. So, so I think the direction of travel for, for rates is obviously clearly down. Um, but, you know, obviously the central banks have uh, and governments have, have other tools at their disposal. And the one is fiscal stimulus. Yes. And you would have all, everyone would have read 
you know, that there's helicopter money, Hong Kong, I mean, they gave all their citizens $1,200, and I mean, there's sort of talk in the US that we're going to have a similar, uh, I guess, um, uh, fiscal uh, stimulus. But the reality is that the level of spending in the economy has been interrupted. So you've had the simultaneous demand, demand and, and supply shock, which is going to be very difficult to uh, support with existing government policy. So I think we, you know, we all need to sort of expect uh, that we are going to have a sharp downturn in terms of uh, economic activity. And I think, as you said, in terms of your opening statement, that the, the infection rate continues to climb. I think the uh, impact of the uh, infection and the, the impact of the quarantine and lockdown uh, is really going to be determined by the extent, in other words, how long this takes to, to, to actually um, remove the virus. Uh, and then obviously the longer it takes, the bigger the damage that it does to growth and by definition corporate profits. So I think that's the big uncertainty. So, you know, to the extent that central banks have uh, some of these tools, monetary and fiscal, we think they'll, 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 they will pull those levers, but it is going to be very difficult to fill those holes, um, you know, to the extent that commercial activity, uh, you know, pretty much ceases over, over this period. So I guess any decision that the Saab does make in the coming months will be based more on economic growth, um, I guess, as opposed to something like inflation. I get, we imagine inflation to stay within that band of 3 to 6%. I think it's roughly in that 4.5% mark at the moment. Um, despite the rand weakness, we've seen the oil price drop significantly. So there's not a hell of a lot of upward pressure in terms of inflation. So maybe I agree with you here in the sense that everything the Saab does we built around growth and a recovery um, should that take place over what period of time? I think, you know, I think that's right. I don't think there's a massive inflation push uh, at the moment. But the one constraint that I think South Africa does have as a relatively open uh, economy is that we, dep we depend on, on offshore capital flows mm. to fund our, our deficits. So I think the extent to which we can cut rates uh, is probably a little bit more limited compared to perhaps other geographies. And, you know, certainly I think from a fiscal perspective, the uh, country's fiscal position is uh, not particularly strong. And I think the COVID-19 uh, really is just going to exacerbate what is a very difficult uh, growth economic environment for South Africa and, um, you know, uh, obviously open up all those risks to the downside across all those various metrics. So I think there, you know, there probably is some scope to have further relief on, on rates, mm. but I would be very surprised if we, you know, if there was a significant, in other words, you know, to the extent that we've seen in some of the other economies, um, reduction in terms of those those rates. Yeah, and I guess the developer doesn't really have that room to move in terms of rates. They're pretty much close to zero now. Um, so we, we do have a luxury in the sense that we were coming off about six and a quarter percent before the virus really hit. I've also 100 percent, 100 percent. And I think maybe just to add on to your point, which I think is a good one, is that, um, you know, we have made the point before that, you know, the Western world by and large has exhausted monetary policy as a mechanism to, you know, resuscitate and, and support growth. And, you know, to the extent now that I think just fiscal stimulus is left, I think we all need to sort of prepare ourselves for, you know, governments around the world to, to really start to access fiscal stimulus in a way which, you know, we haven't seen before. And I think as the uh, economic consequences of what we're seeing now start to roll out, you know, we just think that that pressure on, on sovereigns will continue to build to uh, intervene um, in the sense of states participation in the economies and I think you're going to see a lot more of that activity coming and then of course the question down the line is you know who pays for all of this in the end yeah um, but I definitely think that's that's what we're going to be seeing so you know I've stuck up my next slide here is actually piggybacking again off what you presented at the fund manager workshop a couple of weeks ago was the SA debt to, debt to GDP ratio um, which was kind of hovering now at the 60% mark um, I guess one would expect materially lower GDP um, in the coming quarters, but also a lower tax sort of revenue feeding into government coffers. So does this have a significant um, 
I guess, risk to what is already a precarious national fiscus? And how would that maybe change or shift your forecast from a debt-to-GDP ratio perspective? Yeah. So I think it's a good it's a good point, and I think you know if one looks at the the balance sheet of the of the country and we look at the at the debt position, obviously South Africa is in a difficult position to the extent that uh, the budget uh, actions were not sufficient enough to stabilise our long term debt path. Mm. So if we consolidate the parastatals and ESCOM along with our public sector uh, debt, uh, the the government debt. You know, we, we, we comfortably will be over the 70% mark. That's, you know, 72-odd percent in the next two, three years. That was where we were as per the budget. Now with COVID-19, unfortunately, as you pointed out, you know, the tax base is going to come under significant pressure. We are probably going to see unemployment rise, which means there's less people paying tax. Corporates will make less money. And then on top of that, we are going to have more fiscal participation or support from the government. So in other words, the government, like other governments around the world, is going to be forced to support uh, businesses and consumption and the economy, and that will come at a cost to the fiscal. So, so we think our fiscal deficit, the expectation of you know, a 7% deficit for the year, you know, that number could be closer to 9%. Mm. Um, and certainly from a debt to GDP perspective, given those changes in those uh, factors that you've mentioned, lower taxes and perhaps uh, higher expenditure, uh, we are likely to see debt to GDP accelerate. So, you know, from a truffle perspective, that just further entrenches our view that, you, you know, from a, a, um, a solvency and um, in terms of uh, rating perspective, you know, South Africa is is going down a path where at some point we are going to either have to have uh, uh, IMF intervention or we are going to have to pull back on those government expenditures sharply to be able to balance our balance our books. But the COVID-19 has just tipped a situation which was difficult and made it um, a lot more challenging. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Ian. So yesterday we heard from Andy Headley at Veritas around what he believes or which global sectors would be hurt the most by the virus and those that could stand to actually outperform. Um, obviously, they run a global mandate, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts on how this might translate to the SA market um, from maybe a sector and company point of view. And just as a reference for you, Ian, I've stuck up a slide here. This is also one from your fund manager workshop presentation that talks to the PE levels of the JSC, um, excluding NUSPAs, which a couple of weeks ago or maybe three weeks ago was sitting, I think, just north of of nine, <laughs> the ratio. Maybe touch on where that might be today, and and allude to which sectors you think could be could stand to perform relatively well. Okay, so I think that's a that's an interesting insight because uh, what we what we have learned uh, uh, from digging through the historical uh, data that we could find in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic is that uh, effectively the lockdown and the effects on the economy and certain sectors are not all the same. So as you've said, there are certain businesses which should be relatively more immune and uh, defensive and then more other sectors and businesses which are going to be, um, I guess, more severely impacted. So, you know, when we look at what we found uh, going back in the data in 1918 is that we found that services, the services sector was particularly hard hit. So anything uh, revolving around services mm. um, and where it had a bearing on uh, entertainment, leisure activities, uh, you know, from a, a, a restaurants, food service um, operators, all of these type of uh, businesses really came under severe, severe pressure. And obviously all those uh, uh, subsectors and businesses feeding into those particular industries then got impacted. So there was, we found some data of uh, revenues for some of these businesses falling as much as 80%. Uh, and, and lots of these service businesses run on very, very thin margins. So to the extent that you have no revenue um, or sales of your service over that period, you then are having to carry these costs uh, through that same period. So, you know, when we then extrapolate that and take that through uh, into, um, I guess, our own market and globally. So to give you an example, 
of some of the businesses that would be, you know, obviously very impacted, you know, would be like the travel services. Um, you know, you've seen Avis budget globally, those share prices are down 80%, airlines. Uh, and then, of course, bringing it closer to home, a business like uh, Bitcorp, which effectively supplies restaurants um, and, you know, I guess similar uh, catering operations with their food requirements, all of that literally gets turned off overnight. And on top of that, you know, some of the their exposures would be to the uh, small and medium uh, vendors or restaurant owners, mm -hmm. which don't have the balance sheets uh, and the cash flow to be able to withstand a lot of these um, impacts. So I think at a portfolio level, typically what we would be doing is we'd be standing back and saying, well, you know, which which businesses do we think will be more exposed? And, you know, one of the messages that you would have heard from Truffle over the last couple of years is we've been trying to focus on businesses which, um, you know, effectively do not have a lot of leverage or a lot of debt. Mm. Because irrespective of the underlying business model, if the business is economically sensitive, in other words, the profits are a function of the level of economic activity and are less defensive or annuity based, when you have an interruption to those cash flows and you are carrying a high level of debt, uh, that is when you can potentially suffer an equity shock. And I think the biggest uh, example we could probably talk about is like a Sassol here, you know, where, where overnight uh, their revenues fall by 40% and you're sitting with 137 billion rands worth of debt. So there's, there's going to be lots of examples globally um, of businesses like that. So I think at a portfolio level, the first thing that we've you know, been, been doing for quite some time is to make sure that the businesses that we've exposed capital to um, are not overly leveraged. In other words, they, they have certainly enough headroom mm. to be able to repay that debt. And then on top of that is your question from an industry specific point of view is to make sure that we are trying to avoid businesses where the profitability of those businesses is very uh, volatile and subject to, um, you know, obviously these these factors that I've that I've spoken about. So, for example, we have no Bitcorp uh, in our in our portfolio. Secondly, you know, the other thing that we would have done is um, not not all of the companies are equal in terms of their underlying exposures, and, we, and I'm talking specifically here about the banking sector. So, Standard Bank, uh, for example, has a particularly big exposure to West Africa and to some of the oil producing uh, countries. And with the, with the collapse that we've seen in the oil price and the uh, knock on effects to some of those geographies, uh, Nigeria, for example, where we're likely to see massive currency pressure further, you know, Angola, uh, you're likely to see further bad debt. So, you know, to the extent where where we can switch and improve the robustness of the portfolio. We obviously take those steps. But, you know, from a from a company point of view, a lot of the businesses that we've invested in, um, you know, are, are really uh, defensive insofar as their nature. You, you, you will know we have big exposures to NASPAS, um, which, you know, from a geographic point of view, China seems to be coming out of their infection uh, period and seems to have stabilized it. So, you know, also the business model being gaming and social media should benefit at a time when we all have to, you know, stay at home and uh, in, in lockdown with our spouses for uh, three weeks. So I guess, you know, uh, I, the time that we're going to be spending on social media and gaming and these, these type of platforms will, will probably uh, be very robust and be supported. British American Tobacco, which is another big holding we have, we had a conference call with them at their Capital Markets Day. Uh, seven days ago, and they said they've seen absolutely no impact from COVID on their business yet. Um, and you know, to the extent that we've seen some of the tobacconist shops in Europe as be have been left open as part of an essential service, uh, I guess you know also gives you a, a sense of the uh, defensiveness of those businesses. So I think at a portfolio level, you know, one's looking to improve the quality. Uh, of the businesses, reduce leverage across the fund. In other words, don't have exposures to businesses which may not be able to weather the storm uh, to the extent that you have an interruption to profits and then you can't repay debt. So I think it's basically it's you know sticking to the knitting, which I think is what we've been saying um, in terms of the hygiene factors and making sure that we try and preserve as much capital uh, as we can at a time like this.
and position the fund in good quality businesses so when the um, ultimately we get on top of the COVID-19 and the recovery comes, uh, you know, you should be able to have quite a nice sharp recovery um, having been invested in, in better quality businesses which, you know, should weather the storm and then be able to benefit from, um, from an improved economic situation. Mm. Thanks, Ian. Quite a lot to take in there. So I'm going to go back slightly through some of those names. Um, I'm not sure about NASPERS, but Process is up here to date, um, which is one of the anomalies, I guess, on the JSE. Uh, you also touched um, briefly on the services industry and Bitcorp obviously feeling a lot of pain, and maybe this might um, ring close to home for the lot, of the lot of the listeners on the call, but it's sitting in the queue at, uh, at Spa last night and everyone with their trolleys full. Um, maybe this is a bit short termism um, in terms of my thinking, but you know, do retailers stand to gain in this over the short term? I mean, Woolworths, from what I recall, three years ago was trading over 100 bucks and is now, I think, sub 30. ShopRite has previously almost reached 300 and I think is now a little at about 100 rand or so. Um, is that a fair assumption to make? So I think retailers, food retailers, as uh, are drug retailers, should be more defensive versus discretionary spend. So any any discretionary spend, uh, businesses which rely on discretionary spend are going to face uh, pretty severe declines in terms of their revenue. And obviously, we all have to eat, and we all have to, you know, get our medication. So, you know, historically, businesses are more defensive uh, in so far as their revenues, but will still be impacted by, you know, what is uh, what is happening. So, a lot of these, you know, food. Uh, uh, shops also sell a lot of discretionary items as well, so to the extent that those items um, will sell less. Mm -hmm. But you're 100% correct in that, um, you know, these businesses should be more defensive than a clothing retailer. Um, and, you know, especially if this lockdown uh, has to last, you know, in, in, in Europe and in South Africa, I mean, if it has to go on for a lot longer than, than three weeks to get it under control, those impacts will be a lot more severe. But, you know, I think the, the point that you made earlier in terms of the share prices is a lot of these share prices have come under a lot of pressure. And Woolies, for example, is a business that these levels and, you know, should be relatively uh, defensive compared to some of the other businesses. So I think, you know, if you are, if you are a fashion retailer, I'm not uh, sure how many people are going to be spending uh, in Europe buying buying fashion goods, or certainly from a from an SA perspective. And I think that goes for car dealerships as well. So I think all those type of discretionary expenditures we can expect for the next you know foreseeable future until we get it under control that those expenditures are going to go pretty much to zero. And then the question is. You know, can those businesses survive from a balance sheet point of view? Mm. Thanks for that, Ian. And then I've just moved on to another slide here, which will probably be the final one for the call. Um, just looking at asset allocation over the last sort of 14 months or so. Um, and we've seen a pinch, I guess, in SA equities um, and foreign equities since the start of the year. So the fund really took on a more cautious tone. It's a foreign equity component that I want to touch on briefly. So. I know you held some, or maybe still do hold, your S&P put options, which I imagine are quite nicely in the money, as well as a sizable cash position. Does this afford you a bit of dry powder to use when opportunities present themselves? And if so, what global companies are you looking at at the moment? Went into the year being quite cautious and defensive um, and managed to buy a very cheap insurance on the S&P at pretty much close to its all-time peak, um, which was about 3,350, 3,350. So we bought uh, put options at that level. Those put options are all deep in the money now and uh, you know, obviously would have protected a significant amount of capital as markets drew down. But on top of that, we also had built up a lot of cash um, offshore. So, And that was just really because we felt valuations, particularly in the U.S., had become quite stretched, close to 20 times multiples, and that earnings risks were, were all to the downside that we felt. So we think this year, you, you know, you, now you'll probably see S&P earnings contract, you know, and it could go down by as much as 20%, mm. and that's why, you know, equity markets have come down. So, you know, being in a position to have insurance – 
and our insurance is now paid off. That gives us flexibility because we've now obviously protected capital on the way down, so we haven't suffered that decline. And then obviously our cash balances we are now able to deploy um, into assets which are now 30 40% cheaper than they were at the beginning of the year. So your question in terms of which shares have we been uh, nibbling on, uh, one of them has been NetEase, which is a Chinese uh, gaming company, which share price came down you know, 25, 30 odd percent, so we've picked up some of that. Um, Google, which uh, share price you know, came down also around about 35 odd percent, closer to, to $10 a share, $10.40, picked up some of that. We bought some more Philip Morris. Um, we, we bought um, some Unilevers, which have also been smashed. So effectively, what we've been trying to do is buy into good businesses with uh, very strong moats or competitive advantages. Some of those businesses have net cash on the balance sheet, uh, like a Facebook as well, another name that we picked up at about $140. Um, and, you know, so some of these, these big businesses uh, have, you know, 10, 15 percent, almost 20 percent uh, in net ease's case of their market cap in cash. Uh, at the low point, and I think you know that also provides you with some comfort in this environment where you know businesses are, are under pressure in terms of financing and funding, uh, and you know that they will remain in in business. So I think these type of businesses should be defensive, the ones that I've mentioned, mm. and you know the fact is that we can now buy into these cash flows of these businesses at significant discounts and some of these companies are you know paying us dividends in excess of 10 percent the dividend yields uh, which we think is fairly compelling mm -hmm. so you know to the extent that one has the, had a defensive positioning i think what we've been able to do is preserve more capital um, and the embedded value in the fund is growing to the extent that we've now managed to buy a lot of quality or better businesses at cheap prices and when things normalize, one should see quite a sharp repricing um, of these high quality assets back to their historical multiples. Mm. Okay, thanks for that, Ian. And then probably the final point there is just looking at the foreign bond component. Um, I think it's roughly, well, when I made this chart, it was 9%, it's probably almost 10% of the fund today. Um, these have predominantly been uh, SA corporates listing dollar-based bonds. Um, have these kind of really buffered the portfolio quite nicely? I guess it's 17 and a half rand to the dollar. Absolutely. So the fixed income has done well uh, in an environment where equities have experienced a 30% drawdown. Uh, we, we did sell and take some uh, money off the table in some of our offshore um, bonds. And effectively now getting some of that cash ready to redeploy into some of the equity. So yes, we still have a position, but it's not as big as it was. And you know now effectively, uh, you know, wanting to have some more cash uh, to take advantage of what we think will probably still be quite a lot of volatility um, in the market going forward. And I mean, maybe just one last comment as well is you know one of the factors that we are watching is when those infection rates start to stabilize around the world. Because we, when we went back and looked at the data in 1918, um, what we found is that as soon as the Spanish flu infection rates started to stabilize in, I think it was February 1918, the Dow then proceeded to go up 50%. Uh, over the next couple of months. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, all, all that the market will be wanting to see now is, you know, at what point can this be contained and when the actions taken are starting to take effect, which means that the recovery uh, starts to become visible in so far as, uh, um, you know, when those infections then start to decline and economic activity resumes, corporate profitability accelerates. So, you know, the big question that I think we, we're looking at now is, you know, how long is this going to take to bring under control? And, you know, if everyone takes their medicine, um, and it sounds like the U.S. Donald Trump was sort of pushing to have their economy open by Easter, uh, which would not be a good thing uh, if this was not under control. But if everyone does what they need to do, as soon as those infection rates start to plateau, I think you're going to see risk assets start to aggressively reprice. Uh, what will be a economic recovery, which will come in 12 to 18 months' time. 12 to 18 months. Okay. Thanks, Lady. And I think 
one of the pleasures I have chatting with your team is how academically they approach, you know, some, you know, some of these major topics and themes and just what you touched on in terms of past pandemics, you know, it's, you know, the guys at Truffle don't just go 10 feet wide, but it's 10 feet deep, deep as well. So I think the listeners appreciate that as well. So thanks for your time this morning. Unfortunately, we do have to finish the call. Um, and thanks also to those who have joined us from your homes across the country. I'm, I'm sure you found Ian's insights incredibly helpful and hopefully you can provide some degree of comfort to yourselves and your clients. Um, this call has been recorded along with the previous ones we've had this week. Um, and please do get in touch with your near group investments relationship manager should you wish to receive these. And please join us, I believe, at the same time tomorrow where Omri Thomas will be talking about the Opportunity Fund. And then moving into next week, um, we are hosting calls with the PMs on our Global Property Fund, the Global Emerging Market Fund, our Global Cautious Fund. And then before joining, um, hearing from Yanni Leach, who's head of our Near Group Investments core range on Thursday. And finally, to close out the week, we have Anthony Sedgwick from ABEX chatting um, on SA Equities and the Rainmaker Fund. So thanks again, Ian. Thanks for everyone dialing in. Take care and keep safe. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks to everyone. I hope you have a good day. Cool. Bye-bye.